to our first breakout session this morning. This, uh, this session here will feature uh, Damon Barr, for Damon Barr, and uh, we're grateful that uh, you've chosen to come and to hear from him. We're, we're excited, Dr. Damon Barr is Associate Professor of Teacher Education here at Brigham Young University. His uh, specialty is math education. He's been here since 2006, but before that, he spent 14 years teaching mathematics in elementary school. Uh, and so he brings a, a tremendous experience with uh, public education, as well as uh, teacher education. And uh, for that alone, we'd say he's very qualified to, to address us and share with us some things. But one of, the, one of the remarkable things, or very noticeable things about Damon is that you uh, always sense the, the gospel perspective uh, in, in as he teaches and, and counsels and talks and shares. And so we, uh, we thought highly of him uh, in, in selecting him to be a speaker today to talk about incorporating the the teaching in the Savior's way in, in a subject matter area such as mathematics, typically where we think, well, that, that difficult, isn't that a stretch to do that sort of thing? Uh, but Damon also has an additional recent experience that uh, I think he'll draw on uh, in this presentation. He and his wife served as missionaries in the Cleveland, Ohio Mission Kirtland Historical Sites. Uh, to, from 2015 to 2016, and uh, that's a place of uh, revelation, was a place of revelation, and uh, I think he's going to help us to understand uh, how those revelations uh, still apply and are uh, uh, important for us in our educational responsibilities. So we'll hear from Brother Damon Barr. Thank you. Can you imagine working for a place that um, lets you take a year off and go through a mission? Holds your job for you, holds your office for you. Same dust, same mess was there when I got back, when I left. But I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of amazed by that, not kind of, just totally amazed. Um, I appreciated David Borden's uh, prayer about discipleship. And, and I love Alma's words when he was baptizing. Alma, the old elder, he asked Heavenly Father to help him do that work with holiness and heart. That's my prayer. It's uh, going to take a lot of work on the Heavenly Father's part to make that happen to you. <laughs> sure. um, just some background on me. I taught at elementary school for 18 years. I've been at a college, full-time college dude for um, uh, 22. Is that right? I'm a math guy. I'm going to do the math. <laughs> yeah, 22. Um, I think it's interesting, I was thinking about this when Brad was talking. Um, I decided I was going to be a teacher when I was 12. I was in Mr. DeVee's little district class in Bellevue, Nebraska. And I thought, I want to be like that guy. I want to be like Mr. DeVee. And then just a few years later, I joined the church. And I thought, it's kind of interesting. Those two things happened in relatively close proximity to each other. And so now I'm uh, at a place where the religion I love Let's me do the thing I love the most. It's pretty exciting for me to think about, think about that. Um, I'm going to quote a lot of church publications and uh, particularly modern relations from the prophet. Um, Paul mentioned that we got submission in Kirtland. To be truthful with you, my wife would tell you I'm obsessed, obsessed with Kirtland history. Well, we went there six times before our mission, twice on year long, oh, not year long, week long tours. And so, uh, when we're filling out our mission application, you know, seniors can kind of say a few things. And so I said, um, I'd like to help the Lord fulfill the promises he's made about Kirtland. Kirtland's going to become one of the principal stakes of the church someday. That's Joseph, that's not me. And um, so, uh, and then to be honest with you, just to let you know, uh, we did call the mission president. And the visitor center director and said, by the way, can you put it in the headboard, please? 
Sure. Yeah. So I don't think we use political means to acquire mission places, service, because I'm pretty sure Elder Bednar, Elder Ballard, whoever receive revelation, we could go there. But I will say they grease the wheels a tiny, tiny bit about that. Um, what a great, great thing. You know the half the Doctrine and Covenants was revealed in the Quran? Half of it, eight years. Yeah. Uh, just about everything that lays the foundation doctrinally, organizationally, etc., in the church happened in the Kirtland, Ohio area. So it's no surprise that the, the fun foundation for the Lord's perspective on education was revealed there. No surprise whatsoever, in my head. Okay? So I'm going to talk about those things, but I should say that. Um, the teachings that I'll share are absolutely true. I testify that. I'm certain of it. There's nothing like standing in a room where the Lord said, what I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken, I excuse on myself, and uh, talk to people about that. There's nothing like it. I go back tomorrow. Uh, President Nelson, or President, excuse me, President Nelson called today and said, would you go back on your mission to Kirtland? I say, well, yeah, can we go tonight? Would that be okay? <laughs> I know this place, I love that place even more. So, um, kind of as a background for my job, uh, I, I was a state president, sister daughter's state president, a few years ago, and, and I was excited. She actually smiled when she stopped me. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> most, I think most people do, but. But in 2012, um, we were, we, that's when the new youth curriculum was launched, right? And that's when teaching in the Savior's Way was first introduced through the youth. And I was assigned to teach or think about it. And we got some very, very strict instructions on how to, how to introduce our state to it. I, I was responsible for teaching a group of individuals, of state leaders, and I was the one, only one who was allowed to teach them about it. My counselors couldn't help, my counselors couldn't help. And I was given specific step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it. Because it's pretty clear the Lord was serious about this change in church education. So I remember preparing for that and thinking, oh my goodness, uh, this stuff I'm going to be teaching is the same stuff I've been teaching people about how to teach math for the last 20 years. It's the same thing. That was kind of a cool realization. So that's what we're going to talk about today, is how, um, how that's the case. You might think uh, the title of this talk is sort of oxymoronic. Uh, is that a word? I'm a doctor, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> the key word there is moron. <laughs> Part of that word. Changing lives by teaching math in the Savior's way. The reason that's oxymoronic is because, because two-thirds of American adults fear mathematics. I'm not kidding. And um, so, if there's any place in school that most people think the Holy Ghost does not reside, it's in the math classroom. Um, you know, why would God make me suffer through this kind of thing? But I think um, the title is My Children on the Cross. So, a little background my professional assignment includes providing instructions and methods of teaching other mathematics to pre service teachers, we call that teacher preparation, and in service teachers, we call that professional development, to provide some structure in this endeavor. I participated with a rather large consortium of um, university and public school personnel to produce a framework that we're very proud of and published about called CMI, Comprehensive Mathematics Instructional Framework. It's about taking the fundamental principles of good instructional design uh, that have been part of the math education research for the last 25 years and compile them into a framework that can provide a guide for teachers and learning to teach math in a way that blesses the lives of children and young adults. In other words, as people ask me what I do for a living, I say, well, I teach people how to teach math so kids like it. Yeah, love it. Um, so I'm going to start by reading an email I received from a special ed teacher. Special ed teachers teach a very interesting population. But I, the reason I'm sharing her viewpoint is because you'll see great power uh, exemplified among the most challenging children in the school population. To exemplify the principles we're going to be talking about. This is Kristen Nielsen, a special ed teacher in one of the schools we work with. This is, I have her permission to, to, to read this. She said in the past, 
we have typically pulled out our math resource students out of the general education class, all folks, general education class, to work on deficit skills. I think people call that resource rooms. It's a pull-out program. Um, she said, these students have just gotten farther and farther behind in math. We've worked the last few years to develop a push-in, not a pull-out, but a push-in model for math instruction and provide the tools for our resource students to be successful in the general ed math classroom. Math classroom. Math classroom. With the CMI approach, this would really benefit our research students to discuss math with their peers. So when you talk about CMI, it's this framework we designed at the university that exemplifies or incorporates the fundamental principles of good instruction we, we know what research teaches us about in the last 35 years or so, but they also exemplify teaching in the same way. That's the point. So CMI is this whole thing I'm talking about today. She said, our team decided that a fourth grader named Ben would greatly benefit from the math discussion in his general education class. He has cerebral palsy with limited motor control and great listening skills. He struggled with math skills in the past and cannot write numbers. So writing our numbers and solving math problems is a real, is a real challenge for him. We worked for two years on addition, but he's still struggling with recruiting. He's in fourth grade, that's a first grade notion. Subtraction just seemed to blow a fuse, and he could not count backwards. With the help of his 504A, he participated, oops, he participated in a math discussion in his general ed class this past year. He had a multiplication chart handy for his facts and an iPad to type his answers. He made great connections and often raised his hand to offer his thoughts as if he wasn't, even though even he was incorrect. Now I want you to imagine a child who can't move, uh, raising his hand to participate with his peers and sharing his mathematical thinking. I remember when the teacher first told us about this, I, I cried when she said, talked about it in our, in our sessions. She says, our mind set shifted from focusing on what he can't do to what he can. He really struggled with multi-step problems depending on his aim for direction. However, he's learned from his peers how to solve many math problems with perseverance. He was always willing to try even if he was wrong. He would work with peers at his table and come up with some pretty profound problems. Another fourth grade resource student was a behavior problem last year during his pullout math time. He was quite bright and would not do his work and misbehave to distract others from working. Keeping from keeping him in his general education class this year, keeping him in his general ed class this year for CMI-based instruction, I observed a different child. He was not off task or distracted. He was often the first one finished and enthusiastic to share his work with others, which was correct. After three test scores, chapter test scores of 100, 198% respectively, we signed him out of resource now. Since he met his goals, he maintained these skills Finishing the year with a long-term substitute in his general ed class, who reported no significant behavior problems during the last six weeks of school. He was bored last year with a drill and practice approach for resource math, so he was misbehaved to avoid a task he knew he could do. The thing that's ironic to me is the most um, fearful subject taught in school is the context in which these lives are being changed. The last student I would like to highlight is also a fourth grader who often distracted during math class. It occurred that he wasn't paying attention, but he gained so much more than any test could measure. Early on during the year, his teacher selected him to share how he solved a math problem. He was delighted to shine in front of his peers. However, he made a mistake in his problem solving in public. Without assistance from teacher or peers, he realized his mistake in front of the class and explained his thinking. It was wonderful to see him learn right before our eyes. There are many more examples I can describe of our research students succeeding in math because of CMI in the general ed classroom. We now plan to closely examine each resource math student for their benefit, the benefit they might enjoy from CMI in the general ed class. By pulling them out to work on isolated skills, they kept getting farther and farther behind. Pushing in to the general ed class provided the support they needed. They can be successful in their peers during critical math discussion. So, hopefully, you notice what I, I feel like is a mighty change. That's a scriptural term. In the lives of these two children. They didn't just learn math and learn it well, they became different people. 
Their lives were changed, their character changed. They became engaging, contributing human beings who gained a totally new perspective on themselves. Quoting from the Bible Dictionary, they gained a change of mind, a fresh view about themselves, about the world, and I would add, possibly about God. So I contend, quoting Mormon, the Spirit of the Lord Omnipotent brought a mighty change in them or in their hearts, that they had no more disposition to think less of themselves and to withdraw from full participation in mortality. So here's the question. How is such a thing possible without explicit instruction in the Word of God? We know from Alma 31 that the Word of God has a more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword or anything else. So how, without being explicit in teaching the Word of God, can mighty changes take place in the lives and hearts of the So let's start by, um, in my attempt to explain how this happened, with some quotes from from President McKay. Like, nobody here is surprised by that. In fact, I don't, I doubt if I will be sharing anything most of you haven't heard. Maybe the way we talk about them might provide a new perspective for you. President McKay said, no principle of life was more constantly emphasized by the great teacher than the necessity of right thinking. There are three things that must guide all teachers. First, get into the subject. Second, get that subject into you. And third, try to lead your pupils to get the subject into them. Not pouring it into them, but leading them to see what you see, to know what you know and feel what you feel. He defined true education by saying true education does not consist merely in the acquiring of a few facts of science, history, literature, art, but in the development of character. True education trains in self-denial and self-mastery. True education regulates the temper, subdues passions, and makes obedience to social laws and moral, moral order, the guiding principle of life. It develops reason and inculcates faith in the living God as the eternal living father of all. True education seeks to make men and women not only good mathematicians, I'm glad to put that first, obviously he's inspired, proficient linguists, profound scientists, or brilliant literary lights, but also honest men and women with virtue, temperance, and brotherly love. It seeks to make men and women who prize truth, justice, wisdom, benevolence, and self-control as the choicest acquisitions of a successful life. Character is the aim of true education. Science, history, and literature are what means used to accomplish this desired end. Character is not the result of chance, but of continuous right thinking and right acting. Wisdom is the right application of knowledge, and true education is the application of knowledge to the development of a noble and godlike it is well not only for church people, but for educators everywhere when take, teaching the youth, the young, to have in mind the three C's as well as the three R's, mentioned so proverbially. proverbially. Easy for me to say. By those three C's, I mean character, conduct, and citizenship. The teaching of religion in public schools is prohibited, but the teaching of character and citizenship is required. Now, President McKay's words might suggest some sort of character education curriculum, which, by the way, comes and goes under various names and the pendulum swings to characterize the educational improvement. I have a friend, Jim Melville, back there. He and I have been teaching since Dirk was new and I was a boy. And we've seen character ed come and go a hundred times, haven't we? Under different, under different names. Those character ed curricula are well-meaning and produce good. They are, however, a terrestrial approach to character development that lacks the fullness of the Holy Ghost. That's an expression used by a prophet in his prayer and dedication in the Kirtland Temple. A prayer he testified was given to him by revelation in the west end of the third floor of the temple, probably a day before the dedication. The celestial approach to teaching is now called in the church teaching in the Savior's way. It is teaching in the Savior's way that brings his power, the power to change, change completely and stay changed. To some degree, it doesn't matter what we teach as much as it matters how we teach it. As long as we're teaching the truth, the truth that we have gotten into and has gotten to us. Granted, there's some difference between secular and religious or saving knowledge, but part of the bottom line is how we teach. Thus, one can even teach religious truths without teaching them in the Savior's way, which is not of God. As the Lord said on the Morley Farm in Kirtland in section 50, now we now know section 50, Conversely, we can teach secular truth in the Savior's way, and it is of God. It is not just what we teach, but how we teach it. 
So, summarizing where we are so far, using President McKay's language, true education changes character. True education is teaching in the Savior's way. So we're gonna answer the question, what is teaching in the Savior's way? And how does this reform approach to math instruction I've been talking about, teaching in the Savior's way? So my purpose is to outline five revealed characteristics of teaching in the Savior's way and relate them to current reform-based perspective on teaching mathematics as defined by leaders in, in my field. So using the Curl and Temple dedicatory, dedicatory prayer I just mentioned as an introduction, I'm going, to, I mean, I'm going to say next, I'm going to continue to draw upon the divine words given to the prophet in Kirtland to unfold teaching in the Savior's way as it was revealed in our dispensation. Kirtland was the primary place in my view in which the Lord revealed and directed his way of teaching. And I got to serve a mission there. I'm not going to cite current revelations in chronological order, but we'll attempt to historically contextualize those citations so as not to be confusing. So, point number one. As mentioned previously, not all truth is equal. Some truths are truths of salvation, and obedience to them will qualify us for the redemption of Christ. However, all truth is of God. Therefore, what he says about how to teach applies to all subjects, not just to saving truths. Time out. I forgot to mention, my intention is to have a question and answer time at the end. Um, and I think, and unless I uh, talk slower than I plan, um, there should be plenty of time for that. But if, you're, if you have some, some connection that you really want to shout out, I don't mind being stopped, if that's okay. Otherwise, we'll do it at the end. Either way. So, uh, in the end of December, the 1st of January, and the 1st of January, the Lord revealed the olive leaf, that's section 88, to the prophet in the southwest corner of the second floor of the New K. Whitney store. So here's the New K. Whitney store, and the top picture is um, one of the places in Kirtland called the Revelation Room. Uh, the Kirtland's, the Whitney store was the fourth of five homes in which Joseph and Emma resided in the seven years they lived in Ohio. And Joseph, de Joseph de designated this revelation as the olive leaf because he hoped sending it to the Missouri leadership would help to quell contention between the Kirtland saints and the Missouri Saints, and it outlines the Lord's curriculum for education in the church. Yeah. So, these are words you know. Teach you diligently, and my grace shall attend you, that you may be instructed more perfectly in theory, and principle, and doctrine, and the law, and the gospel, in all things that pertain unto the kingdom of God, that are expedient for you to understand. Of things both in heaven and in earth, and under the earth, things which have been, things which are, things which, which must shortly come to pass, things which are at home, things which are abroad, the wars and the perplexity of the nations and the judgments which are on the land, and a knowledge also of countries and of kingdoms. This sounds like the natural and social sciences to me. And by the way, I don't think it's possible to learn these things while understanding the mathematics that enables them to learn, enables us to learn them more fully. Interestingly, his curriculum was first revealed and used in the, in the first missionary training center known as the School of the Prophets. That's the bottom picture. Uh, it's, it's the room across the wall from the top picture. I was about to point to this as if this were an iPad. You can see what I was pointing to. Sorry about that. But the top picture is the Revelation room, and right across the wall where the chimney is, is the School of the Prophets room. We'll talk more about the sacredness of that room. But I can't see it without having some special feelings. The brethren in the school spend a considerable time studying non-gospel subjects, including reading, mathematics, and writing. The Lord wanted brethren and sisters eventually, who were not only educated in the gospel, but educated in secular subjects in order to increase their ability to contribute to the kingdom. Hence, he defined his curriculum. So point number one is teaching what the Savior wants us to teach is the first point in teaching in the Savior's way. So with those verses as authorization, we're now free to apply other divine directions to the teaching of all subjects, not just religious ones, as we discuss the second point. For example, shortly after Joseph and Emma arrived in Curtin in February 1831, the Lord fulfilled his promise to give the saints his law, that's in section 38, which was revealed in New York. It's instructed that early in this comprehensive revelation, the law of the Lord, the Lord identifies the role of the Spirit in teaching his curriculum. 
he says teachers shall be directed by the Spirit. And by the Spirit, and the Spirit shall be given to you by the prayer of faith, and if you receive not the Spirit, you shall not teach. You've heard that a million times. But the context surrounding these verses indicates that they were originally given to the elders, priests, and teachers of the church who were teach, to teach the principles of my gospel. But we've already received, received the idea that we have divine permission to apply this principle of teaching by the Spirit more widely. In other words, the teaching of secular subjects. Because those are in the Lord's curriculum too. So early in the Ohio period, in fact, even before the prophet arrived in Kirtland, difficulties surrounding false spiritual phenomena were quite prevalent among several of the new saints. It formerly associated with a branch of the Methodist church that invited Germanic and extravagant spiritual manifestations. Emma was part of that church. And you, maybe as you've read some of the uh, accounts of the first vision, you remember Joseph said, I tried to go to these meetings and engage in these dramatic spiritual manifestation performances and I just couldn't feel it. So following a four-day conference in a small schoolhouse built on the Isaac and Lucy Morley farm, during which false spirits that possess and control the movements of some of the brethren were detected, I'm going to take the liberty to change the word preach in the verses that were revealed there to teach, because I'm certain these principles and directions apply to preaching and teaching, two related activities. The Lord first reminds those present that they were ordained to teach my gospel by the Spirit, even the Comforter, which was sent forth to teach the truth. Then reminiscent of section 42 that I reviewed a moment ago, a moment ago he asks and answers a question about the critical role of the Spirit in teaching. He that is ordained of me and sent forth to teach the word of truth by the Comforter and the Spirit of truth, to teach it by the Spirit or some other way. It may be by some other way, it's not of God. Then using almost the exact same language, he outlines the responsibilities of the hearers, the students. And again, he that receiveth the word of truth, but he receive it by the Spirit or some other way. If it's by some other way, it is not of God. Therefore, why is it that you can understand and know that he that receiveth the word by the Spirit of truth receive it as it is taught by the Spirit of truth? Wherefore, he that teacheth, he that receiveth, understand one another, and both are edified and rejoice together. I doubt anyone here has not felt the Spirit guide their teaching, even in teaching of secular things. So, the point is, teaching the Savior's way includes teaching in such a way that the Spirit of God enhances the learning of all participants. So I tell my math education students, you can feel the power of the Holy Ghost just as much in teaching the long division of algorithm as you can in teaching faith, repentance, and baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's my experience. That's my testimony experience. So point number three. Because the language we just read that defines the role of the teacher and learner in these verses are practically the same, it's not hard to see that the learner has the same type and degree of responsibility as the teacher. The Lord said the same thing in that olive leaf revelation. He said, seek learning even by study and also by faith. And then in, in a talk on the Bednar day, which I think is sort of the uh, the uh, replacement of President Clark's charge for church industry. He said, we also frequently are taught, this is Elder Bednar, to seek learning by faith. Preaching by the Spirit and learning by faith are companion principles that we should strive to understand and apply concurrently and consistently. I suspect we emphasize and know much more about a teacher teaching by the Spirit than we do about a learning lear learner learning by faith. Clearly, the principles and processes of both teaching and learning are spiritually essential. However, as we look to the future and anticipate the ever more confused and turbulent world in which we live, I believe it will be essential for all of us to increase our capacity to seek learning by faith. Brothers and sisters, learning by faith opens the pathway into the heart. So I contend, personally, this statement is similar to Prakesan McKay's when he said we should get into the learning and learning should get into us because that's a spiritual process. So Elder Bednar um, quoted some language from the lectures on faith which were first given when the School of Prophets was conducted in the printing office right next to the Kirtland Temple. And in those lectures of faith, faith was defined and two of those definitions were assurance, action, and evidence. And he, Elder Bednar says, 
These elements of faith are not separate and discrete. Rather, they are interrelated and continuous and cycle up. The gospel is not to be meant, meant to be a passive experience. It's an act of faith and diligent effort. So Elder Bednar went on to say, a learner exercising agency by acting in accordance with correct principles opens his or her learning, his or her heart to the Holy Ghost and invites his teaching, testifying power, and converting witness. Learning by faith requires mental and physical exertion and not just passive reception. Thus, learning by faith involves the exercise of moral agency. To act upon the assurance of things hoped for and advise the evidence of things not seen from the only true teacher of the Spirit of the Lord. So how does one teach in such a way as to inspire learning by faith? Elder Bednar said, we're all familiar with the adage that giving a man a fish feeds him for one meal. Teaching the man to fish, on the other hand, feeds him for a lifetime. As instructors, you and I are not in the business of distributing fish. Rather, our work is to help individuals learn to fish and to become educationally self-reliant. This important objective is best accomplished as we encourage and facilitate learners acting in accordance with correct principles, as we help them to learn by doing. So now Elder Bednar moves from these sort of subtle philosophical or theoretical statements to an explicit statement about the teacher's role in helping their students learn by, to learn to learn by faith. I've observed a common characteristic among the instructors who had the greatest influence in my life, and I don't think he's just talking about Sunday school and priesthood teachers. They've helped me to seek learning by faith. They refused to give me easy answers to hard questions. In fact, they did not give me any answers at all. I drive my students crazy sometimes. <laughs> we won't talk about that. Rather, they pointed the way and helped me to take the steps to find my own answers. I certainly did not always appreciate this approach, but experience has enabled me to understand that an answer given by another person usually is not remembered for very long, if it's remembered at all. But an answer we discover or obtain through the exercise of faith typically is retained for a lifetime. The most important, most important learning of life are taught, not taught. Now in math education, we teach the same thing. Jean Piaget said each time one prematurely teaches a child something, he could have discovered himself. That child is kept from inventing it and consequently from understanding it completely. Randy Phillip out of San Diego State said, because children can construct their own informal mathematical knowledge by interacting with their environment, they can solve problems in novel ways before ever being taught how to solve such problems. No one of the Lord said in section 43 that we should bind ourselves to act. So point number three is, Teaching in the same way includes teaching based on the belief that learning is a deliberate act of agency and requires much more activity than merely listening. Point number four. During the multiple days in which the law of the Lord that I was talking about a few minutes ago, section 42 was revealed, another revelation was received that we now know as section 43. These revelations, section 42 and 43, were revealed in the Newell K. Whitney home and in the part of the room that you can see in the picture. These revelations were designed to strengthen the role of the prophet in the minds of the, of the people as the only one authorized to receive revelation for the church. Following the first few verses that deal directly with this issue in section 43, the Lord says, in effect, okay, now we've found out the way the church is supposed to operate. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Let's get back to how I want the church to function. And we're gonna start by talking about teaching and learning in the church. So the Lord says, And now behold, I give unto your commandment that when you are assembled together, you shall instruct and edify each other. So again, this is in that olive leaf revelation section 88 revealed in the Whitney store. Um, then the Lord goes on to say, And as, and as all not, had not faith, seek ye diligently and teach them one another words of wisdom. Appoint among yourselves a teacher. Let not all be spokesmen at once, but let one speak at a time, and let all listen to his sayings. sayings. That when all has spoken, then all may be edified of all, and that every man may have an equal privilege. So supposedly in the church, we're done with the days of the talking head of the front of the class, right? This teaching in the Savior's Way book says, when the Savior talked, he did more than just share information. He gave his disciples opportunities to ask questions and share their testimonies. 
His pattern for teaching and learning invites us to teach one another the doctrine of the kingdom, so that all may be edified of all, and every man may have an equal privilege. As a teacher, you can encourage uplifting discussions enriched by learning learners' experiences and testimonies. Even small children often have much to contribute. A robust discussion is not your primary goal as a teacher, but it can support that goal. To help learners increase their faith in Jesus Christ and become more like Him. So I'll say this, and I said this as a state president, so I'll just repeat my opinion here. Um, if we don't engage people in our classes with the opportunity to teach each other, we preclude the full outpouring of the Spirit that's possible in the educational setting. That's my view, and I think you can see that maybe I'm not too far off. Now, in math education, we think the same thing is true. Rochette said, thinking with others develops the capacity to think alone. Yakel and Cobb talked about social mathematical norms, which makes possible all students' active participation in the discourse, in the conversation. From a recent document from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, it says effective mathematics teaching engages students in discourse to advance mathematical learning, which includes the purposeful exchange of ideas through classroom discussion and gives students the opportunity to share ideas and clarify understandings, construct convincing arguments regarding why and how things work, and learning to see things from others' perspectives. Students must have opportunities to take, to take with, respond to, and question one another. To me, that sounds a lot like what I just read, teaching the Savior. It's in, but it's in a math document. So point number four is learners, the learner should be speaking as much or nearly as much as the teacher. Point number five. There is more, one more major message from section 88, the Olive Leaf, that I will use to conclude my talk. And we're all familiar with this command. Organize yourselves, prepare every needful thing, and establish a house even a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. What was the Lord talking about here in the revelation revealed in this place? Obviously, the Kirtland Temple. Interestingly, for almost the rest of this section 88, the Lord intermingles the direction to build a temple with another direction, the direction to establish a school, the school of the prophets, which was in a sense the very first missionary training center. For example, right after the command to build the temple, the Lord spoke a verse we discussed previously, appoint among yourselves a teacher. Now listen to the following verses and ask yourself, is the Lord talking about the temple or is he talking about the school of the prophets? Verse 2128, he that is appointed to be president or teacher shall be found standing in his place in the house which shall be prepared for him. Therefore, he shall be the first in the house of God. In a place that the congregation in the house may hear his words carefully and distinctly, not with one speech. And when he cometh into the house of God, the teacher comes from the house of God, for he should be first in the house. Behold, this is beautiful. Let him offer himself in prayer upon his knees before God. A few verses later, the Lord says, Behold, verily I say unto you, this is an ensample unto you for a salutation to one another in the house of God, comma, in the school of the prophets. Next verse. And you're called to do this by prayer and thanksgiving, as the Spirit shall give utterance in all your doings in the house of the Lord, comma, in the school of the prophets. That may become a sanctuary, a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit to your edification. See what I'm talking about? Let's keep going. He shall not receive any among you into this school, save he be clean from the blood and sin of this generation. Is that language about a school or language about a temple? And he shall receive, receive, receive by the ordinance of the washing of feet. This is a temple ordinance that we don't discuss very much. It was administered in the Kirtland Temple, but before that, it was administered in the school of the prophets in the Whitney store. You get what I'm saying? A temple ordinance was performed in that room you see on the right, a school. Additionally, there are multiple visions of see. It was administered in the Kirtland Temple, but before that in the School of the Prophets. Additionally, there were multiple visions of deity in the Kirtland Temple. For example, in section 137, the heavens were opened to us, and I beheld the celestial kingdom of glory. This is where that was revealed, by the way, through for the Kirtland Temple. And the glory thereof, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. I saw also the blazing throne of God, 
where I was seated in the Father and the Son. By the way, did you know Joseph Smith saw the Father and the Son in the Kirtland area seven or eight times? He saw the Savior again three or four more times. And four or five of those visions of the Godhead were in the Kirtland Temple, and two or three of the visions of the Savior were in the Kirtland Temple. But the members of the Godhead were not just seen in the Temple. They were seen in the first school of the prophets, in the Whitney School. About the day the first presidency was fully organized, following a series of revelations that spanned a year and a half, the prophet's history records this that occurred in this room. In a meeting of high priests on March 18, 1833, Joseph, quote, this is from the history of the church, exhorted the brethren to faithfulness and diligence in keeping the commandments of God, and gave much instruction for the benefit of the saints with the promise that the pure in heart should see a heavenly vision and after remaining a short time in secret prayer, the promise was verified for many present had the eyes of their understanding opened by the Spirit of God, so as to behold many things. Many of the brethren saw a heavenly vision of the Savior and concourses of angels and many other things of which each one has a record of what he saw. For example, in this room, in the school of the prophets, Zebedee Culture said, At one of these meetings after the organization of the school of the prophets, we were all together, Joseph having given instructions, and while engaged in silent prayer, kneeling with our hands uplifted, each one praying in silence, no one whispered above his breath, a personage walked through the room from east to west. And Joseph asked if we saw him. I saw him. And suppose the others did. And Joseph answered, that is Jesus, the son of God, our elder brother. Afterward, Joseph told, Joseph told us to resume our former position in prayer, which we did. Another person came through. He was surrounded as with a flame of fire. I experienced the sensation that it might destroy the tabernacle as it was of consuming fire and great brightness. The prophet Joseph said, This was the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I saw him. Speaking of the Savior only, John Murdoch, who was also there, said, The visions of my mind were open, and the eyes of my understanding were enlightened, and I saw the form of a man most lovely. The visage of his face was sound and fair as the sun. His hair a bright silvery gray, curled in most majestic form. His eyes a keen, penetrating blue, and the skin of his neck a most beautiful white, and he was covered from the neck to the feet with a loose garment, pure white, whiter than any garment I've ever seen. His countenance was most penetrating and yet most lovely. Therefore, the first place where the school of the prophets was held was a temple of sorts, and the school of the prophets was held in the temple. Therefore, the places of learning can and should be holy, Places. So to emphasize this, returning back to um, some special ed children who are involved in some of our math education work, I'm going to share with you a portion of an interview of a special ed teacher who's been working with her regular ed compatriots in helping special ed children engage in mathematical inquiry. And I think these will exemplify the power of teaching in the Savior's way, no matter what we're teaching. I'm nervous, but I'm excited. It's good. And I, I just love knowing that it's good, effective content. It's exactly where they're supposed to be. It just feels good. So, so um, I think you told me that you actually asked some children, the sixth grade children you work with, what this was like. Yeah. Would you mind reviewing that? What did they say? Yeah, they, I specifically said, how do you feel about this math instruction versus the math that we were doing before? And they were like, they said things like, I feel more confident in my regular class. I feel like I, I know what I'm doing. They recognize, they would say, I take a little bit more time to learn things than my other peers, and it, I can get it now, and things like that. Um, it gives me more time to learn it, which is good. Some of them said, they were talking about specific um, content in math, they said they were sitting there in a group and they were explaining it the way they did. In the right right class? Yeah. They were explaining it the way they, they had understood it in my class. And they said that they saved the day 
or something. <laughs> they were all confused until I stayed today. <laughs> uh, so things like that where even if they don't have a perfect understanding, their confidence is going up. And when someone's confidence goes up and they believe in themselves, then it just kind of mm-hmm. keeps coming up. So even that, even if their academics didn't come up that much, they were more confident. It's awful. That's that's even better to me than anything. So that that was cool. Um, but overall, just they said that they understood it more. And talking to their teachers, they would raise their hands. They would answer. They they're not just sitting there like staring off. They were engaged. They and they recognized that. So that was neat. Did they ever compare themselves to their regular peers? Yeah, I think they do that all the time. And they, they still just, did. But they were explaining it. What did they say? Basically saying, I can't learn as quickly as my peers, but with this type of instruction, I am getting it faster, or I'm, I'm, st- I'm understanding. I can keep up with them. I mean, that's comparing right there. You know, but mm-hmm. rather in the past, like I'm so stupid, they're so much smarter than me. It's they're recognizing their differences, but hey, I can, I can get the content now. Mm-hmm. So it, that was huge. That's why we're teachers. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Right. So I'm contending that these children she's talking about, who were in their seventh year education, seven years of mathematical failure, were changed. Not just in learn, being able to learn mathematics more proficiently, but they were different children than they were because of this way of teaching. So they weren't taught about the Savior. But they were taught mathematics in the Savior's way. So I tell my students, maybe you can't teach about Jesus, but you can teach the way Jesus wants you to teach. So we may be prevented from explicitly teaching about the Savior in America's public schools, but we can teach in His way and enjoy great gifts as we do. I know that's true. So uh, this is time for questions. Questions or comments? Yeah, please. I just would like to go back to the five, the, the, the five points that you had, because I really, I want to get those done. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. thanks. I'll make it bigger. Okay, other questions or thoughts? Impressions, feelings, uh, humorous anecdotes, whatever. What do you think? Please, Jennifer. Um, I find a dollar for every time my students ask me that question, I could teach for free. I wouldn't, but I could. Um, so it's one thing to what you have to teach, and another way, another idea of teaching when you have to. I was working with a teacher a few years ago in one of our professional development systems, and she was in a school just like that. I won't tell you what district doesn't matter. And um, she said to me, I love what I'm learning, but I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be allowed to teach this way. She's a first grade teacher. Um, but after a little while, she said, I'm going to sneak and do it anyway. <laughs> so yes, I'm the author of Subversion. That's right. <laughs> you say you want a revolution, you know, Beatles would say. We all want to change the world, right? OK, so um, what was interesting is um, not only did they have to teach the same thing at the same time in the same way, they had common assessments administered the exact same thing. Well, it turns out that she was a first grade teacher, and after a while, on those every three week common assessments, all of her um, her first grade children always performed 20 or 30 percentage points better than the other children. And then here's the crazy thing: is uh, she came about January. She came to a unit, a three-week unit. She said, my students already know this. We can skip it. But she still had to give the common assessment, and guess what? They still performed 20 or 30 percentage points higher than the other children in first grade without even having the formal instruction associated with that unit that the other teachers provided. So um, I guess I'm 
the answer to your question is uh, sneak, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, Marilyn? It's a video of six-year-old children doing double-digit multiplication. Yeah, pretty cool. It's not like there. You know, anyway, it's pretty great. I'll just say it that way. So I saw their hands. Yeah. I just wanted to, to agree with you on the, the teaching, you know, kind of sneaking in. Because I, I finally left public education about six years ago uh, because it became very communistic. I'm sorry, that's the only okay. thing I can... Okay. It, it was very, very So now the Davis Church is uh, hiring people to learn how to teach teachers to teach this way. In fact, the curriculum director started crying too when she realized the power of this in front of about 50 principals and assistant principals in her district. Because she could sense the power, power of this, and she was one of those math folks too, so that's why I meant a lot to her. So I saw another hand over here, sorry. Go ahead. In the answer in the demonstration. So in these active learning styles um, that I think you're describing here, at what percentage do you actually introduce um, content or demonstrate prior versus let the student discover first and then proceed to actually afterwards after they've discussed and been able to teach one another about these ideas, turn around and then correct or show up a clearer path? Um, the fundamental rule is never say anything a child can say. But once a child says it, you can utilize that to everyone's benefit. It's called allowing, using the thinking of one child to move the thinking of the entire class. And part of the CMI framework that we designed is designed exactly what you just shared. It's having this very wide open discovery and then still using a discovery or inquiry based approach, guiding children to very deep and mathematically sound thinking. And, and helping them learn to eliminate misconceptions without us correcting them. They correct each other. Like that child I read about, who stood up and corrected himself in front of 2,900 children his age, right? And you can make an eye. So that makes sense? Yeah, that's the process. You're going right ahead, then there's a question right now for you. No, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. I was just going to mention that uh, apparent in all this and uh, the instructions on teaching the safest way is uh, the adage or uh, no, I guess the invitation to pray 
for those who are in our classes. Uh -huh. You know, and that's that one thing that I've found at least in the past couple of years is I've become kind of uh, moved from my early in my education career to a more that I've noticed that if I'm praying for my classes more, it's a lot better. Yeah, and for you, what do you do? Uh, I teach math at Concord I knew there's something special about you. <laughs> you that glow about you. That's right, yeah. Uh -huh. Go ahead, sorry to make your way. Has this been tested in um, inner cities? Mm -hmm. Really, I would love to. Mm -hmm. uh, one school in Alpine, Barry knows about it, Jim probably knows about it. The most diverse school in Alpine, 95% free and reduced lunch. They were the top performing school in the state on end of level tests for, for schools at their socioeconomic level and among the top schools in both traditional and alternative assessments of math understanding. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I showed you special ed kids, right? A similar kind of population are typically challenged when we set low expectations for. Mr. Seastrand, Dr. Seastrand, Brother Seastrand, good friend. Uh, one of the challenges that I think in the scale of public education and scalability of the whole concept is trying to help the professional learning of teaching. And you've been able to do that pretty successfully, and yet there's still just so few people who have the capacity to help enlarge uh -huh. this process. So what, I think one of the challenges within public ed is just saying, well, I know of a district that says we have to teacher proof our program, so we've got to make it the same, so it doesn't matter where the teacher comes from, what background they've had, et cetera. And I'm just wondering if you could address that in terms of how you go forward and how you, how you would deal with that in terms of uh, scaling up scaling up and building capacity right so right. that we could see greater proliferation of this process um part of the cmi system we have a cmi framework a cmi professional development program and a system for scaling up and it's all about being strategic in the way you build capacity as you start small Dream big, start small, move slow, right, David? Mm -hmm. Who says that in your department? Joe Matthews. Yeah, Joe. That's what I thought. Yeah, I wanted to quote him. So, um, if you're strategic in building capacity and kind of, you look for people who have kind of get it, and then you apprentice them. As as we're moving in um, in small in small ways, and if you're strategic about that, you can you can build capacity exponentially over time if you're content to start small and move small. But it's all about being strategic and building that capacity as you do. Is that strategy inclusive of ranking officials who need to have the perception direction? Have you done work in that regard? Uh-huh. And yeah, for example, next Thursday I'm going to meet with uh, the three area directors and the assistant superintendent of Davis for the third time to talk about how their, what their role is and making sure this is supported from your ministry point of view. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a team thing. University, university and public school, administration, curriculum, principal, teacher, district office, we're all got to be focused in this, who doesn't work. Mighty change is mighty hard work, the only Maxwell said that. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think the time is far spent. I think we've heard that song before. So, um, how many want to see the movie? All right, I'll do that. And the rest of you, thanks so much. And uh, I'm honored that you come. I didn't think anybody would come.